Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. In this one, we're going to be talking about Prussia. Now, by me saying that, some of you might have gotten excited and think, all right, military history. We're going to look into the 18th and 19th centuries, the military powerhouse of Europe that had the most disciplined forces and forming formed the core of the German military into World War I. Others of you hear the word Prussia, you're already starting to zone out, and you've always been confused by that word because you think, Prussia, that sounds like Russia. Those are the same, right? Well, they're not the same. They were allies with each other in different wars. They also fought against each other. They were allies in the Napoleonic Wars, for example. And you might think, Prussia, is that like Germany? Well, it's part of greater Germany that isn't unified until 1871, but it's the most important German state, and it sort of leads Germany, and it's at the forefront of that unification. Was it like the Habsburg Empire? Is that right? Uh, not exactly. They're more closely linked to Austria. Were they the Holy Roman Empire? No, they're a small state in that. I mean, this is where European history gets super, super confusing. But I'm going to make this interesting, even if you have no idea what Prussia is, because Prussia has a very important role to play in the modernization of Europe in military history. And in some ways, the military culture that Prussia fosters leads directly into World War I, which is one of the watershed moments of modern history, the 20th century, and creates our modern world. Let's start with a description of what Prussia was by the French statesman, Count Mirabeau, who said that Prussia was not a country with an army, but it was an army with a country. And I think that's a good entry point into understanding it. Some people disagree. But let me explain the description of that to give you an idea of how it could be true. In the absolutist monarch period of Europe from the 16th to 18th centuries, the biggest budget drain of any European state was the military. Typically, it cost 20 to 30 percent of a budget. But the Prussian army accounted for as much as three quarters of public expenditures for Prussia. And that was even in times of peace. In also not just military terms, but political and social and cultural terms, Prussia was thought of by its neighbors as centering its culture on its army in, to a degree that just didn't exist elsewhere. It was like ancient Sparta almost and how important the military was. And this acceptance of the centrality of the military in Prussian society seemed to be accepted by just about everyone. The basis for this episode comes from listener Michael McKenna, and he asked what it was like to be in the Prussian military. Michael says, I graduated from West Point in 2011, and it seemed a lot like what a Prussian military academy might be like. I recently visited a fortress at Koblenz, and I've since been wondering what it would be like to be a young junior officer in the Prussian military at the time, just before Bismarck. Bismarck is uh, Otto von Bismarck. He leads German unification in 1871. And Helmut von Mutke. Uh, Mutke, there was a father and a son. They were very important generals, uh, chief of staff of the German military, while they were working in stride to build the German Empire. I wonder what it would be like to be a Prussian cadet, and what kind of assignment could I expect? Would I be impressed by the military fortresses, or would it be miserable to just sit there and guard a river? Well, that is a very excellent question. And I'm going to do my best to answer that, uh, what it would be like. But I'm just not just going to go through the motions of saying, here is what it would be like to be a soldier in 1860 or 1750. You would wake up, you would polish your musket, later your rifle, you would practice drills, yada, yada, yada. I mean, there's a little bit of that minute we'll get into. But we're going to talk about much broader issues. First of all, how Prussia, because it was a very militaristic state, it was a hinge point between medieval and modern armies. And they, in many ways, created the army, uh, the modern army that we understand it now. We'll talk about how militaries evolved from in the past, from the early modern period. They were basically composed of officers who were almost without exception from aristocratic backgrounds, and they treated enlisted men like slaves, and maybe they would have some mercenaries here. How that model evolves into the military being the great equalizer that unites a nation where enlisted men come from all backgrounds, anyone can be promoted officer, it's all based on meritocracy. And some say this meritocratic institution created Prussia. We'll talk about Frederick the Great. He was a military genius that Napoleon himself worshipped as the greatest mind of his time. We'll talk about how the Prussian military worshipped Hannibal of Carthage, who was the leader of the Punic Wars against Rome. And particular, the Battle of Cannae, where 
Hannibal encircled and entrapped his enemies and annihilated a Roman force, and this is considered one of the great masterpieces of military strategy, the German focus on this inspired them to be able to defeat larger enemies through superior tactics. This informs their entire strategy of World War I, and this leads to the uh, trench warfare of that particular war. We'll talk about why the Prussian military was the forge that created Germany, and it created a militaristic society that led to World War I. So that's all the things that we'll get into in this episode. But first of all, I want to talk about something that's a description that's still used, an aphorism to talk about German society, and that is Prussian virtues. There was a set of virtues that guided Prussia, its Prussian military, and it's also its society. Prussian virtues refers to virtues associated with the historical kingdom of Prussia. Prussia was a kingdom within the German Confederacy that goes back to the Middle Ages. And the virtues are especially associated with its militarism and the ethical code of the Prussian army. But it was also bourgeoisie values as well. And they were as influential in some ways as Calvinism was in German society. Uh, it also significantly influenced German culture, the contemporary German stereotype of being efficient, being on time, and being disciplined. Today, if you happen to work in a German workplace, there's very, very little chit chat in a German workplace. You show up, you do your work, and then you promptly go home when the clock strikes and you're off the clock. So these virtues can be traced back to Teutonic Knights, but they were named by King Frederick William I of Prussia. He was called the Soldier King, and he was also a reformer of Prussian administration. His son, Frederick the Great, followed on and also promoted these values. And uh, not just in their military, they imposed this on their administration, and they took over an indebted public budget, and they brought things into line. So here are just a couple of these uh, Prussian values. There's a lot of them, but uh, I'll include them here. Austerity, courage, determination, discipline. A phrase that goes with this is learn to suffer without complaining. Godliness. And this is interestingly enough coupled with religious tolerance. Let everyone find salvation according to his own beliefs. There were Catholics and Protestants in Germany in addition to Jews. So you had to be a little bit religiously inclusive. Other virtues were incorruptibility, industriousness, loyalty, obedience. A phrase here that goes with that is be obedient, but not without frankness. Punctuality, restraint, self-denial, self-effacement, subordination, toughness. And the motto here is be even harder on yourself than others. So let's begin by looking at the development of the Prussian military. And there's a wonderful article by Peter Drucker from 1941 called What Became of the Prussian Army? And he's linking the Prussian military history to what was happening at the time with World War II and the German army then. What he argues, and I think there's a lot of truth to this, is that it's easy to treat an army as a mechanical conglomeration of manpower and equipment. You just think of an army as soldiers and their artillery or their weapons. But it's probably equally important to look at an army's spirit and morale. And probably no army has this been truer than the Prussian army, because all of its wars were fought against stronger forces in terms of material strength, but especially because of the function of the Prussian army was not a military one at its core. The Prussian army was originally a political and social organization, and its military system and its achievements were the results, not the causes, of its political and social functions. So this goes back to the idea that Prussia was a military with a nation, not a nation with a military. The Prussian army was a conscious and artificial creation. All the other institutions of modern Europe grew naturally with their functions and with the challenges of European society, but the idea of the Prussian army was consciously conceived and formed. It was the work of four Prussian princes that ruled in succession from 1640 when the great elector Brandenburg came to the throne. And at the time, Prussia was a tiny, backward, and depopulated principality within Germany, crowded out by much stronger neighbors, the Habsburg Empire, France, Great Britain. But from this period in the 1600s until 1790, when Frederick the Great died right before the Napoleonic Wars, Prussia was Europe's leading military power. So these Prussian rulers understood that they lived in a period of great change in which the old models in Europe, the feudal, decentralized, and sometimes anarchic society of Europe, with its divided authorities and competing authorities of great nobles and free cities and bishops who ruled autonomously, kings who were kings in name only and really didn't have that much authority— Prussia really understood that this order was changing and states were growing in power, they were modernizing, 
new technologies allowed uh, primitive mass production, literacy was growing, and a state that could capture all this and harness all this energy into a modern military could rise on top. These Prussian rulers also understood that these new forces would crush Prussia, as they were a very small, small state with big neighbors, unless they could be organized according to principles. But this is the key to understanding the Prussian army. Prussia couldn't copy the national states of the West, of its bigger neighbors. Up to 1866, Prussia's territories weren't a contiguous whole, but they were spread in disconnected parts all over northern Germany. There wasn't any social or historical unity between, let's say, Polish-speaking peasants in the East and the Burgers, these old nobility uh, in the rich cities on the Rhine, who were economically and culturally dependent on France. Religiously, Prussia had Lutherans, it had Calvinists, it had Catholics. This is right after the Thirty Years' War in the 1600s when all these groups were trying to kill each other. Prussia in the 1600s was poor. It had no foreign trade or very little foreign trade. It was attacked on all sides by stronger neighbors, first Sweden, then Denmark, then Poland, then the Netherlands, then France and Austria. And Prussia couldn't be centered on national unity, which was the foundation of modern states in the West, where Britain and France could claim an ancient historical connection that bound them all together. Prussia didn't have anything like that. The concept of the nation as the basic principle of organization was a very different history in Western Europe and wasn't something that really guided the different German states um, up to the time of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. And Prussia was only a part of Germany. So in this situation, Prussian rulers devised a new type of ideology or a different ideology in order to unite everyone together. These were the concepts of centralization, sovereign government, and the primacy of the state. But they also include traditions of feudal chivalry and loyalty between king and officers. So this bond became a bond between officers and enlisted men. This forced Prussia to organize a new state in the form of an army. But while the emotional foundation was medieval in its character, the ideas of chivalry, above all, the Prussian military didn't have any of the feudal structure of medieval society. Many of the officers were yunka or yunkas. The Junka was originally one of the members of higher nobility in Germany, but it wasn't by any means an aristocratic class, and we could sort of call them middle class, if that term applies to this period. The Junka evolved to a general denotion of a young or lesser noble, and sometimes this lesser noble was politically insignificant and not a noble at all, sort of a country squire. Many Junka families had prepositions such as von, like von Schlieben, or zu before their family names. But in their mentality, the Junka were not aristocrats. Uh, in many ways, they could be considered middle class. The great majority of the Junkas were hardly better off than well-to-do farmers. And this is very important because the Junkas were the officers of the Prussian army. They weren't aristocrats like you would see in Britain. And up to World War I, many of the aristocrats went directly into the officer corps, and almost all the officers were from these more elite backgrounds. The large estates of the Yunkas were large only if you compare them to five-acre plots of the peasants in Prussia. But they were very small compared to the land holdings of the genuine feudal aristocrats. So with the more humble backgrounds of these officers, you already see meritocracy emerging. Such large holdings were the rule in all of Europe before the French Revolution. But the average Yunka estate hardly had more than 300 acres. A thousand-acre estate was very unusual. And the soil in northern Germany was so poor that farming had to be extensive, especially before artificial fertilizers were invented. Even a thousand acre state didn't yield more than, <coughs> even a thousand acre state couldn't give someone more than a modest living. And 300 acres was considered the absolute minimum for efficient production in all but basically the most fertile soil. Socially, the Junka had functions of a local justice of the peace and magistrate. He was the patron of the local church and had jurisdiction in minor criminal cases. One of the local landowners was also responsible for the roads, the schools, and taxes in each district. But the Junka didn't have any of the privileges and rights of the feudal leaders of the old regimes in Germany. They didn't have the privileges of universal tax exemption, which European noblemen had almost universally before 1789 in the French Revolution. The Prussian Junka joined the army as a second lieutenant, and he had to live for years on low pay usually retiring to his estate with a rank of major and a small pension when he was 45 or 50. So essentially, the position and function of the Prussian Junka wasn't better than that of an English squire. Economically, he was considered below the level of the squire and barely above that of lower middle class of an artisan or a small tradesman. 
The middle-class nature of the Yunkas also shows up in their mentality and in their cultural life. So they carried on to a fault the Prussian virtues of thrift and sobriety and industry and obedience to duty. These were also those of the rising middle class. They also had the faults of Prussian virtues, narrow-mindedness, smug self-righteousness, and lack of imagination. They couldn't think outside the box very well. So the Yunkas may have lacked the sophistication of the European aristocracy, but there wasn't the same type of entitlement and corruption. And they were much more hardworking and they were desiring to prove themselves in a way in the 18th and 19th centuries that other European officers weren't. Maybe that one of the best illustrations of the middle class character of the Yunka officer corps on which the Prussian army and the Prussian state was founded is the life and atmosphere of the Prussian court. In the 18th century, even the smallest princeling in Europe imitated Versailles, Versailles Palace and the court of Louis XIV and bankrupted himself and his subjects in an attempt to buy all the latest European and French fashions they possibly could and imitate the splendor, splendor of the French court in order to show how well-to-do they were. But the kings of Prussia, especially Frederick the Great and his father, they counted every penny. They lived very cheaply, like a miser. They lived in an old palace, not much better than a barrack, and Frederick the Great himself lived in barracks. All the other courts in Europe worked out the most elaborate ceremonies they possibly could. They had their powdered wigs and all that stuff and tried to build a barrier between themselves and even their closest advisors. But the advisors, friends, and generals of the Prussian king sat down with him once a week for a completely informal party over beer and sausages. They smoked their pipes, they swapped stories, they called each other by their first name. And this middle-class Prussian army was, you can't deny, an extremely successful political concept. It turned Prussia from a poor backwater in the 1600s. In another century, it was the only power in Central Europe. And this allowed people from poor backgrounds to enter high-crust Prussian society. You could become a Prussian simply by adopting the Prussian formula. And Prussia could draw upon a talent pool all throughout Central Europe. A large part of the leading Prussian officials and all the philosophers and theoreticians of the Prussian idea came from outside the country. They entered Prussian service only as mature men in full consciousness of the fact that their step was similar to that of entry into a religious order. So yeah, it is like entering a monk order where your background could come from anywhere, but as long as you pledge devotion to the order, then you'll be accepted into the ranks. So at this time, Prussia really doesn't have a national consciousness and it really only comes together with the German unification of Bismarck in the second half of the 19th century. And this uh, model of Prussian virtues and Prussian military character is adapted to Germany. All right, so that's just kind of a basic background of the idea of Prussia and the idea of the Prussian military. Before I get into what it was like as a soldier, uh, I want to zero in on Frederick the Great. So we're going to talk about Prussia in general. Then we're going to go high by one of its greatest military leaders, and then we'll zero in on the soldier experience. So Frederick the Great, or Frederick II of Prussia, lived from 1712 to 1786. He's sort of a patron saint of tactical genius. He's the forefather of the German Empire. And there's maybe nobody that Napoleon respected more than him. And he lived right up to before the Napoleonic Wars. Frederick the Great's story begins when he was fleeing for his life and he was about to be killed by his father. All right, so how did that come about? Well, here's what happened. In 1730, Frederick, who was the crown prince of Prussia, was fleeing for his life to England under the cover of darkness. The young 18-year-old traveled with his tutor, Hans Hermann von Kott, and a group of young army officers. They likely would have arrived safely to England had not a brother of the prince's companions ratted out the group when they were mere Mannheim in the electorate of the Palatinate. The young son was forcibly returned to his father's court, and his tutor was executed. He himself was court-martialed by his father, and he could have been executed himself if not for the intervention of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI who claimed that a prince could only be tried by the imperial diet of the Holy Roman Empire itself. Frederick himself was in prison for two months and then exiled from the court itself for another six. This was the relationship that Frederick had with his father, Frederick William I of Prussia. The elder Frederick was a strict disciplinarian of the highest order. He took Prussian virtues more seriously than anyone possibly could and trained his son to be a soldier from birth. The younger Frederick was awoken each morning with the sound of cannon fire. He was given a regiment of children to instruct and drill at the age of six. Later that year, he was given a miniature arsenal. The king instructed his son's tutors to beat him if he was thrown off a charging horse or committed such wrongdoings as wearing gloves in the winter. 
because he thought he needed to be toughened up and be able to handle cold exposure. Frederick the Great fancied himself an enlightened absolutist. This is not like his father is all, at all, the soldier king. Frederick the Great promoted religious tolerance among Catholics and Protestants and Jews in Prussia. He promoted the arts, and he patronized such court musicians as C.P.E. Bach. He also aspired to be a philosopher king in the mold of Plato's The Republic and the life of Marcus Aurelius. He endorsed the philosophical underpinnings of the French Enlightenment, and he kept up a long-term correspondence with Voltaire. Now, this is in complete contrast to his father. Frederick William was a soldier king that created the massive war machine of Prussia, but he didn't promulgate a unified culture or a rich civil society in the messy collection of small principalities that made up his domains. Prussia had an enormous army of 200,000 soldiers, but it didn't have a common national identity. It's for this reason that Prussia, under the reign of his father, Prussia under the reign of Frederick William, and into the reign of Frederick II, was described, like I said, as a not a country with an army, but an army with a country. Frederick the Younger didn't desire a soldier or general's life, but when circumstance and the man met, he embraced this new role as probably few other people ever did before. He was given a superior army and he took full advantage of it, embodying what some have described as the utmost in military achievement that was possible in Europe and the conditions prevailing before the French Revolution. Frederick the Great knew how to defeat superior numbers with superior troops and superior tactics. He also knew when to replace belligerence with diplomacy. Although he took up his career reluctantly, Frederick built a legacy that lives on today in modern Germany. Frederick was born in 1712 in Potsdam near Berlin, and I'm talking about uh, Frederick the Younger here, not Frederick the Elder. He was the oldest son of Frederick William I of Prussia and Princess Sophie. Following his failed attempt to flee Prussia when he was 18, his father decided not to execute him, but he did execute his tutor while his son was forced to watch. Frederick was pardoned, but he lost his military rank. He was also forced to acquire the education in military and statecraft that he had been avoiding in the past. Frederick the Great eventually undertook his education with gusto, and he, after a long period of studying military strategy and politics, began writing books. In particular, he wrote A Refutation of the Prince by Machiavelli, and it was entitled Anti-Machiavel. Frederick's thesis stated that the concepts described in the classic primer of power politics, the prince, were no longer relevant in the 18th century. Maybe they made sense in the late Renaissance and the early modern period, but not in the period of Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great grasped the political change that had taken place in Europe as it transitioned from the city-states of Machiavelli's age to the small number of powerful states and empires of Frederick's age. In 1740, Frederick William died, and Frederick II ascended the Prussian throne. Shortly afterward, Emperor Charles VI of Austria of the Habsburg Empire also died. Prior to his death, Charles pondered deeply over his choice of successor, and he worried that his daughter and heir, Maria Theresa, wouldn't be accepted as legitimate heir to the throne. Habsburg dynastic law didn't accept a female as the ruling monarch, but Charles VI lacked a son, and he had no other choice. To avoid any belligerence, he created the Pragmatic Sanction of 1713, which allowed the hereditary possessions of the Habsburgs to be inherited by a daughter. And I'm mentioning all this as background to the conflicts that Frederick is going to come up against later. But France and Bavaria both had designs on Austria, and Frederick did as well. They were all eager for a political environment in which a weakened Habsburg empire couldn't defend its valuable land holdings, and they could pick them apart piece by piece. Frederick told Maria Theresa that he was willing to help her in military matters, but this would come at a price. He said that in exchange for cooperation, he would get the province of Silesia, and that'd be incorporated into Prussia. Well, Maria Theresa refused. So Frederick declared war on Austria, and this conflict became known as the Austrian War of Secession. The Prussian army wasn't battle-tested, but it was the most skilled and best trained army in Europe. Frederick inherited a standing army of 83,000 men, and by the way, this would grow to 190,000 men by the time that his rule ended. The army recruited presidents from the countryside and it paid them by taxing townsmen, who in turn were exempted from military service. And most importantly, Frederick prevented nobles from interfering in military matters, creating a more personal link between him and the national army and the conscripts, and it made the soldiers feel like they weren't just pawns in noble or aristocratic matters that they had no say in. Nobles weren't any longer the filter through which military reforms occurred. In 1749 and 1764, Frederick uh, issued legal decrees that limited the obligations of a peasant to his lord. 
So this is part of the modernization efforts that Frederick was a part of with the Prussian military. Well, European nations were suspect of Frederick because of these modernization reforms of weakening the aristocracy and by gobbling up more land and then wondering if they were next. So Russia, Austria, France, Saxony, and Sweden united together against him. Austria and France, which had traditionally been enemies with one another, now formed an alliance. Frederick, who's concerned for Prussia's security, entered into an alliance with Britain and the House of Hanover at the Convention of Westminster. In 1756, he invaded Saxony, and this was part of what started the Seven Years' War. And this is a global war. It affects people all over the world, from Frederick to George Washington in the British colonies when they're fighting the French. They called the French-Indian War there. Well, Frederick had a number of disadvantage in this war, in almost all of his wars, in terms of men, in terms of equipment, but he was still able to succeed due to the superior training of his troops, which prevailed time after time in battle. Frederick also used superior tactics against his much larger enemies, and I'll talk about his flanking maneuvers that he uses all the time. He wouldn't give the nations that composed the alliance against him an opportunity to combine all their forces together while they were on the march and launch a unified attack against him. So he mitigated the alliance's uh, strength in numbers by attacking with a smaller but more skilled army. His army traveled in smaller units, which made logistical lines much easier, and then they would combine together immediately before a battle. If you just had a large lumbering force working together, all right, strategy is simpler, but they're more easily able to be picked off by an enemy, and they travel much slower. Additionally, his opponent's reliance on traditional battle formulations exposed their vulnerabilities. Frederick inspired his troops through his personal involvement in battle as well. He was sort of like Alexander the Great or Hannibal of Carthage or Khalid ibn al-Walid in the Islamic Caliphate in that he rode out with his military forces into combat. As a result, over his career, six horses were shot out from under him in battle over his lifetime. Frederick's bravery and tactical brilliance earned him a reputation as a genius, especially for his use of the oblique order of battle. And this is a little bit confusing, but bear with me because this shows how he's able to succeed time and time again with fewer troops. This is a military tactic in which an attacking army focuses its forces on a single enemy flank, and his army then targeted the enemy's weak point, using the remainder of his forces to fix the enemy line. Once he effectively punched a hole in their defenses, then his army would create an angled formation to concentrate their forces. Then they could envelop a flank of the enemy and defeat the enemy in detail. Okay, that sounds pretty easy in principle. Attack an enemy at their weak point and then punch through. It's like somebody giving you investment advice. Buy low, sell high. But this relies on um, a lot of discipline and very precise maneuvers in battle, which is why a few people could do it. Executing this order required three things, and this is why it was so difficult. First, you had to have precise formation. Each officer had to know how to form a battalion from line to column, maintain its place in the column, and then redeploy the troops in place for an attack. Second, the soldiers had to march in formation in step. This required structured formations. Lastly, his enemies couldn't be aware of the formation since it could be countered with a quick response. So these requirements are difficult for one commander to execute, but it wasn't difficult for Frederick. He loved details. He loved knowing all the information of a battle. He didn't subcontract out the actual execution to his officers. And he was also skilled in the art of deception so that his enemies didn't know what he was up to. The masterpiece of his military career happened on December 5th, 1757, at the Battle of Luthen. Frederick had recently won a victory over the French at Rosbach on November 5th, which secured Prussia against a French invasion. They didn't have to worry about their western flank, so they could focus on the east and they could turn to the powerful Austrian force. At Frederick's command were 35,000 men, 133 squadrons of cavalry, 78 heavy guns, and 98 battalion field pieces. What he was facing at the Austrian army at Silesia were 85 battalions, 125 squadrons, 235 guns, and 60,000 troops. And they were a highly professional force. Frederick had been defeated by them three times in battle. According to his intelligence, the Austrian army created a four-mile-long defensive line near the village of Nippern. Frederick's plan of attack went in the following order. First, the army was preceded by an advance guard of 60 squadrons and 10 battalions, led by Frederick himself. Four columns of the army followed behind, with the infantry forming the two middle columns and the cavalry in the wings. His advance guard was the first to encounter the Austrian advance cavalry guard, which wasn't part of the main army. 
Frederick ordered his cavalry to charge the Austrian front with the full support of his infantry. This force routed the Austrians and forced them to flee back to the main Austrian camp. Over 800 Austrian infantrymen and five officers were captured. The Prussians quickly captured a favorable position over the entire Luthen plain on a grassy knoll. They prevented an Austrian counterattack by placing a battery of the artillery on the knoll, and it sloped downward so they had the superior location there. Frederick made slow progress, but soon the Austrian cavalry was forced into retreat. They were forced from their initial position and fell back on the village of Luthen. The Austrians then attacked to change their position and form a new line parallel to the Prussian front. The Prussians entered Luthen, and the focus of battle now centered around a churchyard that was surrounded by a tall stone wall. The Prussians took the church, and the Austrians remaining in town were driven north. They attempted one more counterattack outside of the town against the Prussians, but Frederick ordered his left flank to attack the Austrian right. The latter were dispersed and fled in disorder. They soon came under attack from three sides. With the assault, the Prussian victory had been won. They suffered 6,300 casualties, and the Austrians 10,000 casualties, and 12,000 of the men were captured. Additionally, 131 Austrian guns were captured. This was a major loss of firepower. So that was his biggest victory in terms of what affected Prussia long term with its land holdings. This came in 1768 when Frederick was concerned with Russia's growing power. It was constantly fighting and winning wars against the Ottomans, and it had ambitions to take over huge chunks of its land, especially in the Caucasus Mountains and the Crimean Peninsula. Frederick's brother Henry proposed that the Prussians make their own land grab by seizing Poland and partitioning it between Prussia, Russia, and Austria. Everyone would gain to win in that regard. Well, Frederick captured this area and quickly set about to assimilate it in his own domains. And a lot of times assimilation wasn't successful because you would take over another ethnic group, they, their loyalty would always be flimsy, and if they had the chance, they would rebel, or they would never completely integrate into this empire. But Frederick had a detailed plan of assimilation, just like he did with military plans, and here's what he did. So Frederick renamed the new territory West Prussia. He required that his ministers learn Polish, even though many of them showed contempt for the new province of Poland, or West Prussia. And Frederick encouraged German people to move to this acquired territory and uh, populate it, farm it, reform the education system. And this plan worked. As many as 300,000 Germans settled in West Prussia. There was new land open to them and new opportunities, and they took advantage of this. So as a result of his military victories, his acquiring of Poland, and his 46-year reign, Frederick took Prussia, which was a very small German principality that wasn't important at all in European affairs, and launched it to the top tier of European powers. He doubled its land size, and he made it the dominant force in the German Confederacy. This uh, act of unification eventually led to the unification of the Prussia's princely states and then all of Germany in 1871, and all of this was built on the groundwork that he laid. Also, there was the promotion of universal education, the codification of law occurred in his reign, and this spread throughout Germany later on. He transformed their military from an aristocratic institution to a feature of society that was relevant for all social classes, whether it was noblemen who still formed the backbone of the officer corps, the middle class that supplied the army, or the peasants that made up a bulk of the rank and file soldiers. Okay, so let's actually break down and get into what it was like for a Prussian soldier in the 1700s and the 1800s. And a lot of this information comes from a wonderful book by Dennis Showalter called Soldiers' Lives Throughout History. Dennis Showalter is a military historian. Well, was. He passed away about 10 years ago. Uh, he has another great book called Frederick the Great and His Wars. His books are really informative, but they're also easy to read. He has a fun style. He always he likes to use power tool analogies and talks about the Prussian buzzsaw and other things. So uh, pretty fun books to read. I highly recommend uh, the books by Dennis Showalter. So he talks about uh, soldiers' lives throughout history, not just Prussia, but what it was like to be a soldier as Europe evolves in the 18th century, right after the Napoleonic Wars. And he goes up to German unification and the Franco-Prussian Wars of the 1870s. He starts the book by noting that with the Prussian military, when it comes into power and it consolidates with Frederick the Great, it happens at the time in European history when something revolutionary is going on. Military service comes to be seen as the responsibility of all citizens. And this is a big change. 
Because before this time period, in the late medieval period, in the Renaissance, and the early modern period, the aristocrats formed the officer corps. Then you would have peasants who were the infantrymen. They were treated like slaves. And they almost had to be because they didn't have any stake or vested interest in what happened in wars. They didn't feel any kind of greater kinship with other people. There wasn't really a strong idea of being a Frenchman or a German or an Italian. That came later with universal citizenship in the 19th century, when more and more people are allowed to vote, when more and more people have political representation. But in the Renaissance period, when there's still a division between aristocrats and serfs and maybe some merchants and other people in the middle, that type of unified um, universal belief of citizenship and national unity doesn't exist. This changes after the French Revolution. And I want to be clear here, it doesn't change overnight. This is a multi-decade long affair. This is over a century but it does change where the idea of being an individual with connections throughout larger society makes uh, someone feel more invested in the outcome of a war as a rank and file soldier than it would in the medieval period where you might be forced into war or maybe the only people fighting it are aristocrats who are leaders and then some mercenaries to whom a lot of the combat is farmed out. So the democratic and republican governments that were created and inspired by the French Revolution, they wanted to link self-governing citizens as opposed to obedient subjects to their states in waves that formed linkages and identities that were unlike those that had come before them. So military service after the French Revolution and as Prussia becomes more and more powerful, it became a citizen's obligation. And for many men, it became an honor, not something to avoid or something that you didn't understand and you had no vested interest in. This system developed inconsistently throughout the 19th century. The authoritarian governments of the period of the restoration of France, which is a period of 1815 to 1848, had a difficult time trying to entice men to serve in the military. Even at this time, many men failed to see any connection between their own lives and the aims of the state's ruling elite. Much of the motivation for the massive emigration from Europe, out of Europe, to America and other places in the same time period Stem from the desire of men to avoid having to get involved in the military and compulsive military service in the states that many of them despised. They didn't want to fight if they didn't see any gain for themselves. They didn't feel like a Frenchman. They didn't feel like they really belonged or had a stake in what happened. They were forced to perform duty, but they didn't have any representation. The enduring and popular responses to calls for military service in 1914, however, in the First World War, showed that Throughout this period in the 19th century, men became increasingly willing to risk their lives for the goals of their state. And Prussia is centrally involved in this transition, and in many ways, they're the first state that is a part of this transition. So the development of nationalism and the growing presence of the state in the lives of individuals played a critical role in this change from people wanting to flee a country because of warfare into actively getting involved and seeing it as a matter of national honor. So the period from the French Revolution of 1789 up to the Franco-Prussian War of 1871 is what Showalter called the Age of Men. The wars of the French Revolution represent a major watershed in military history. And the most important change involved the types of men who became soldiers and their motivations for becoming soldiers. There were some changes in weaponry at this time, and most notably the widespread adaptation of the rifle which made it possible to shoot someone accurately from what was before a few dozen yards with a musket to hundreds of yards with a rifle. When this changes tactics, you have to be much more flexible and you can't just march in simple columns and then fire like Napoleonic tactics. The new technology didn't shape soldiers' lives in this period as deeply as did the development of the professional national soldier, which again, uh, Prussia led the way on. But after this period of time, Kate a period that Showalter calls the Age of Machines. This is roughly after the Franco-Prussian Wars in 1871. This period was notable for the development of industrial methods for the manufacture of weapons. In this period, the increase in the killing power of weaponry was so huge and so little planned for that it had incredible impact on the daily lives of soldiers and not just on the battlefield. In this era, the infantry weapon that killed the most soldiers went from being the rifle which if you knew what you were doing, you could fire six shots a minute, this is in the hands of a trained soldier, to the machine gun, which could fire 600 rounds a minute. Developments in artillery, armor, aviation, gas from the 1800s and early 1900s 
all complete a picture in an age of warfare that are dominated by machines. And you see this in World War I over and over again, where there's an artillery barrage and then a whistle is blown, men go over the top of the trench and they run and they are just completely slaughtered by machine guns. In the early part of the Age of Men, we'll call it, Imperial armies didn't have lots of infantry. They relied on aristocrats for their officers and mercenaries to fill it out. But despite the advantages of mercenaries, you had to train corps that you could quickly call up. You didn't have to train them. You just had to pay them. No army wanted to rely on them too heavily. The mercenaries came from the same general social group as native soldiers, but they had even less connection to the communities that they served than native soldiers did. They had no outstanding loyalty at all. Their loyalty was to who would pay them most. And they had terrible reputations. Communities didn't want them in because they were known for being criminals, for drunkenness, for pillaging, for raping. And if their pay didn't arrive on time, then they might take compensation for their lost wages by plundering communities that they were being paid to protect. So most governments didn't want to get involved with them and they didn't have to, and they preferred conscripted men who were closer to home. Because large numbers of soldiers could usually be hired or rounded up or coerced to serve when needed, officers really didn't have any incentive to treat them well. So as a result, the life of the average European soldier before the French Revolution was absolutely terrible. So being a Prussian soldier even at this time was terrible. You had intense discipline. You had poor living conditions. You had non-existent medical care and terrible food that was given to you. So a prison uh, soldier's camp could feel like a hospital camp or a prison colony. You would have a regimental commander who didn't show much care for his men and it was rare for them to care about their well-being. Several commanders rented their units out to perform agricultural labor, and they would then pocket the proceeds to fund their lavish lifestyle. This practice did fall into disfavor in Western Europe in the second half of the 18th century, but there's still this entitled attitude where an officer sees himself as lord and his men as serfs. Most officers thought of their men as unreliable, they were rabble, they were prone to drinking, getting drunk, being irresponsible. Frederick the Great often said that he wanted his soldiers to fear their officers more than they feared their enemy. And he thought this was partially the, the only way that they could hammer in the discipline necessary for his tactics to work. He thought that only through brutal discipline could soldiers become reliable enough, both on the battlefield and in the barracks. If discipline was ever brought down, then this would unleash the what he called the inherent barbarism in the nature of his soldiers. And his observation on soldiers to fear their officers more than anything else and their enemies, this influenced the general attitude of Europeans towards soldiers and the lives they led. So soldiers were little better than common criminals to your average European officer, and they thought they deserved similar treatment. There are on taverns plenty of signs that forbade soldiers to drink in their establishments because they didn't want their bar torn apart. Innkeepers thought that soldiers brought with them violence and prostitutes and probably a visit from the local police that would create problems for them. Far more in excess of whatever money they could earn off of them, especially since soldiers weren't paid very well. And communities regularly tried not to host soldiers or avoid it if at all possible, even when they were ordered to quarter them. Wealthy towns would collect money from residents in order to pay for housing soldiers in neighboring towns that needed the business. Towns believed that the money was well spent as a kind of insurance policy that protected their property and their daughters from soldiers. Even the relatively popular French army, created by the levy of en masse in the French Revolution, where many soldiers were conscripted, uh, townspeople just thought they were unkept, they were disorderly, and they simply weren't worth the trouble. For most societies in the age of men, soldiers continued to come from social classes that were deemed by the aristocracy to hold little redeeming social value. As a result, criminals, orphans, vagabonds, or others continued to be overrepresented in the soldier ranks. This system, and I'm talking about the pre-revolutionary French system, was the polar opposite of the French system after the revolution. Instead of recruiting men closest to their societies or their towns in the hopes of forging close links, the armies of Austria and Prussia and Russia and the Italian and German states look to enlist men with the weakest connections to their societies. Most continental armies still relied on the press gang, the decision-making process of local officials and hiring mercenaries to fill the ranks. Several of them rewarded volunteers by giving them promotions to the rank of non-commissioned officer, but all of them looked on soldiers as kind of like failed civilians. Now let's talk about Prussia's military reforms and how it pushed against this system. 
They had major reforms after the War of the Fourth Coalition. The Fourth Coalition was a coalition that fought against Napoleon's French Empire, and they were defeated in a war that spanned from 1806 to 1807. The main coalition partners were Prussia and Russia, along with Saxony, Sweden, and Great Britain. More than 25,000 Prussian soldiers surrendered, and another 25,000 lay dead or wounded. This was a major humiliation, because the French had just suffered the 8,000 casualties, and this was a huge blowback only a couple of decades after the incredible successes of Frederick the Great. Within 10 days, Napoleon was in Berlin, and Frederick William had retreated all the way to Moscow in search of asylum. The resulting Treaty of Tilsit, which was made in July 1807, this rubbed salt in Prussia's wounds. The Prussians agreed to cede to France all German territory between the Elbe and the Rhine rivers. Prussia also agreed to pay an indemnity to cover France's war expenses and to reduce its army to only 42,000 men. So for a nation that had such a proud military tradition, its military basically created Prussia, this humiliation of loss on the battlefield and a humiliating diplomatic treaty proved to be too much to bear. It was shaken to its core, so the Prussian army sought to reform. And the most important change came in recruitment and the type of men that Prussia sought to turn into soldiers. Prussian leaders tried to build an army using the same kinds of men that the French had used to defeat them. A little bit ironic if you think about it. Prussia looked to create a new army based on national sentiment and patriotism, not beating people into being an obedient soldier. The Prussian ruling class abolished serfdom, and they spoke in language of nationalism and national unity in the hopes of creating soldiers that would fight with the same kind of zeal that Napoleon's forces had shown in fighting for him. So as soon as Napoleon's military fortunes started to ebb, the Prussian military grew by using a system that was closer to universal conscription than anything that existed in Prussia before. Like in France, many middle-class men, and a few women as well, volunteered out of a sense of nationalism in order to chase the foreign invaders out. In 1813, as France had done, Prussia opened its officer corps by privileging talent over birth for promotion. You didn't even have to be a uh, Junka anymore. So counting on patriotism to motivate men, discipline became much less harsh. I mean, it's still Prussia, it's still harsh. The lessening of discipline was a welcome innovation for Prussian soldiers. They also simplified drill, which meant less marching and focus on education and marksmanship. This is part of what causes Prussia and later Germany to be the most educated area in Europe uh, in the 19th century. In the new Prussian army, soldiers are no longer basically like automatons, uh, machines that you just uh, wind up and let go, driven to fight by fear of what their officers would do. And the conditions in the army weren't so terrible that the population would not refuse to join the ranks or even risk death to emigrate to America so they could avoid military service. What reformers hoped is that these changes would produce an army of talented, motivated men fighting for national goals out of a desire to liberate their homeland. That wasn't the case um, in the early part of the 19th century, but over time it does become the case. In the probably, I would say, by the third quarter, it's really locked down, especially by World War I. Okay, so let's look quickly how militaries were structured, because this gives us an idea out of the loyalty that a soldier felt. They wouldn't feel loyalty to the whole army. But what was the unit to which they would know other soldiers and feel like they belonged? Regiments, which were most often commanded by colonels, formed the largest units that men would normally identify. The regiment would provide the insignia that men wore on their collars, and the unit lore and the history that they talked about in the mess halls and the barracks and the battle stories that they would share with each other while they were drinking. A typical regiment contained between 1,600 and 2,000 men at full strength, but in peacetime, a regiment might have as few as 500 to 600 men. Colonels headed a staff of regimental officers for leadership and administration, but the real heart of a regiment was its non-commissioned officers, especially the nearly omnipotent to his soldiers, regimental sergeant major, who arguably could be the single most important individual in the entire unit. This is because the regimental sergeant major had the most direct contact with the men, and he was likely to be the man that troops looked to as the final authority on all matters. Uh, his word to them was law, even when it went against official policy. And the reason is that the officers relied on him for accurate information on the men, and he was the one that translated their general orders, and sometimes orders were very general and very vague, go take that hill, into practical instructions to the men. So regiments in turn formed according to their size, brigades, divisions, corps, and armies, 
But the units were usually too large to place any demand on the men's loyalty, and he wouldn't feel loyalty to them. So the unit had a special status to which many thousands of men belonged. The division, though, was the most important operational unit for most 19th century armies because it was large enough to include the three principal arms, infantry, artillery, and cavalry. Sizes and compositions varied, but typical British divisions in the end of the Napoleonic Wars contained about 6,000 men. But few men identify closely with the divisions or the corps. Instead, their loyalties moved down through smaller units, usually composed of men who knew one another closely. On a personal level, joining the army meant joining a regiment. As a soldier, joining a regiment was a process of induction and training and initiation. And the psychological goal of militaries in the 19th century, whether Prussia or elsewhere, was to shape civilians into long-term and even lifelong members of the unit. So a man had to make the transition from civilian to soldier. And systems of training in Prussia and elsewhere involved making the transition from civilian world to the regiment look painful. Part of the logic of military training has been on, based on the assumption that a man's civilian beliefs and his support systems have to be torn down and taken away so he can be rebuilt into the mold of a soldier. Part of the reason is these national armies, it would include men from different regions that might speak a very different dialect from one another, have very different traditions. Somebody from Bavaria in Germany might have almost nothing to do with somebody from Berlin. It would be like in the 19th century, somebody from New York talking to somebody from the Bayou in Louisiana and speaking pidgin French. So the military training has presumed that a man must lose his individuality to become a functioning part of the whole. That's the psychological component. And the idea being that he has to lose his association to a given locality and ethnicity or religious affiliation, that it's not so important to be Lutheran or Catholic or Jewish. And he has to do these things in order to better serve the nation as a whole. For peasants with a very localized worldview who hadn't ventured beyond his village much, this could cause a lot of difficulty. The process of changing men from civilians into soldiers also tried to make individuals more or less replaceable. And with militaries that look like machines, this was an important goal. A man could leave the army for a wide variety of reasons, including desertion, discharge, disease, or death. And in some cases, you might have enough notice to get a replacement trained in time. But other times, especially in the pitch of battle, men might have to step in quickly and replace somebody that fell. So they had to become interchangeable parts within their battalions and their regiments. The low level of skills of armies in this period made the operational requirements of this kind of interchangeability really easy. Forcing men to act like cogs in a big machine helped them to make the mental transitions necessary in order to enter the soldier's world. Military train systems have also involved changing the peasants' religious and moral convictions. Not that they have to abandon their religious beliefs, but they can't be as outward about it as they could at home. Not all soldiers, of course, were religious. And if you look at periods like the French Revolutionary period, which were very anti-clerical, then you had to keep your faith to yourself. Until Napoleon's agreement with the Catholic Church and the French government, few units welcomed chaplains, and even after that for many years, they weren't welcomed very much. And members of religious minorities often faced unofficial and official pressure. But many men from these religious communities took their vows and their religious convictions seriously. It was hard for them to abandon them, especially if they had beliefs like the commandment against killing, which is one of your main duties as a soldier. And you didn't have to be religious to be turned off by all the gambling and smoking and drinking and womanizing that went on in military units, and they displayed as a matter of course. Furthermore, for soldiers from the period from 1789 to 1870, they were products of nations that hadn't yet fully formed, and they really didn't have a deep sense of community or commonality. A man of a given unit, although they were all from Germany or France or wherever, they spoke different dialects, and they might even be mutually incomprehensible to one another. They often practice different religions, and sometimes they place their own loyalties to their localities over that to the nation that they were all a part of, but not many of them really understood. In the most extreme cases, like the states of Eastern Europe, let's say the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you could have Austrian men, Slavic men, Serbian men, Bosnian men. They might see their fellow soldiers as their real enemies due to their long-standing rivalries and hatred between one another and might not think at all of their enemies that are hundreds or even thousands of miles away who they're supposed to attack. Okay, so that's the basic idea about what life was like as a soldier. In our final section, we're going to be jumping ahead to the 1870s, uh, past 1870 German unification, 
and see how the Prussian military tradition led to World War I. We're going to be looking at an article about uh, the place that the Battle of Cannae, that Hannibal of Carthage fought, and its mystique, and how it made Prussians see themselves and Germans see themselves, and how it led to World War I in many ways. So the Battle of Cannae, which I'll talk about in more detail, it's the masterstroke of Hannibal of Carthage. And long story short, it allowed his small army to defeat Rome, the military juggernaut of the day, through discipline and shock tactics and lightning speed. And that's what German, Prussia and then Germany saw in itself, that we might not be the largest European nation, we might not have the longest legacy. With our superior tactics, we will defeat any juggernaut that comes our way. In this way, the Carthaginians defeated Rome, and Germany could defeat Austro-Hungary, the Russians, and the French. So this begins with, uh, we can jump ahead to 1914, February of 1914, with General Helmut von Mutke the Younger. He'd later be chief of the General German staff in World War I, and he sent his son a book. His son was at the War Academy studying for his entrance exam, and he sent him a book and a word of advice. Study Kane. The book was the highly regarded work of General Alfred von Schlieffen, the former chief of the German general staff, a man who spent years creating an invasion plan of France that would be used in World War I. Schlieffen's studies of encirclement battles had led to his Canet concept, the idea that envelopment and annihilation are the highest aims in battle. Frederick the Great also loved these. And subsequently to the Schlieffen plan, the basis for German strategic doctrine right before World War I. So why had this battle that was fought over 2,000 years ago fired up Schlieffen's imagination? That's because of the romance of Canet in the history of the German army and in the experiences of Alfred von Schlieffen. Hannibal's victory over Rome is legendary. You have a leader who's young, he's marked by brilliance, he's fighting a superior army that's motivated by a crisis. And the tactic is a double envelopment that's choreographed perfectly well. And the result is total annihilation. This is the sequence that appealed to Schlieffen, that he thought, um, if we encircle and trap our enemies perfectly, we can completely wipe them out. And it offered a model for German military experience. Frederick the Great, who was the embodiment of that experience, was a man of out of the mold of Hannibal. His tactics also resembled Hannibal's that gave structure to the Kine concept. Frederick often coupled his astonishing speed where I talked about he would break up his divisions and then his entire army would unite together right before battle and they could move around faster than other European armies with the oblique order, this staggered advance that placed the extremities of his wings at the most forward positions. So the ends of the wings are the highest up and it makes envelopment much easier. This maneuver is best illustrated by what I talked about earlier, the Battle of Luthen in 1757. And it resembled Canet because Frederick was outnumbered, but he drew the Austrians forward and then he launched a flank assault and he inflicted eight times as many casualties as he suffered. So he won with a envelopment maneuver. It wasn't a double envelopment maneuver like Hannibal did at Canet, but these victories still supported the concept that Schlieffen promoted. So the other pillar for Schlieffen's idea was erected by the elder Helmut von Mutke, the father of Mutke who'd become chief of the German general staff in World War I. So Mutke had the spirit of Frederick, he had the example of Napoleon, and the resources of industrial Prussia, and he imagined war on an absolutely unprecedented scale. He had the doctrine, he believed in strategic envelopment, and he combined this with rapid mobilization and concentrated force and mobility in order to encircle and annihilate an enemy. The envelope maneuver worked at many battles for the Prussians, like Koenigratz in 1866, when an Austrian unified command was taken out by three smaller, more mobile Prussian armies. So maneuver was impossible for the quarter million Austrians, as it was for the Romans at Canet, and the war ended before it began in one sense. Four years later, against the French at Sedan in the Franco-Prussian Wars, Mutke repeated his success. But the double envelopment at Koenigratz uh, was reminiscent of Canet, but Sedan was an even greater achievement. It was a Canet-like encirclement, and it was a victory that the German history called unprecedented. I mean, the precedent was Canet, of course, but by duplicating Hannibal's victory, Mulcahy's doctrine became the truth of the German general staff, and Schlieffen couldn't help but base all of his theory on it. As a cadet, he'd studied Frederick, and as an officer, he'd witnessed Konigratz, 
And in 1900, nine years after becoming chief of the general staff, Schlieffen read historian Hans Delbruck's account of the Battle of Cannae. Delbruck argued that Cannae was the watershed battle of ancient history because of Hannibal's victory and also because of Rome's defeat. It was so catastrophic that Rome changed its entire military structure and it conquered the world. So Delbruck claimed that Hannibal's success was due completely to the cavalry attack from behind, to the infantry's double envelopment, and it served as a cauldron and it contained the Romans while the cavalry exerted pressure on it. So when Schlieffen read this, he ordered the general staff to prove that Cannae was the prototypical Western battle, and he set about trying it. He already developed a plan for an offensive against France in a vast wheeling maneuver through Belgium, which they actually would in World War I. But Cannae gave him new confidence in this plan, and he set down its specifics as though they were coming directly out of Hannibal's mind. So in 1910, at the War Academy Centennial, Schlieffen announced, in front of every commander lies a book on military history. In it, one finds the heartwarming reality, the knowledge of how everything has happened, how it must happen, and how it will happen again. So the Schlieffen plan called for the German army to focus everything on a sweep through Belgium to northern France, so broad that it would take in Paris. It was a flanking maneuver that instead of on a battlefield like Hannibal did at Cannae, it would go around multiple nations and include millions of men and billions of moving parts. And the idea was that the French would be rolled up from behind like the Romans at Cannae. But there were some important differences. There was no shock like of the double envelopment maneuver. Delbruck had regarded the infantry as a simple barrier, but he didn't deny that Hannibal's victory was due to multiple surprises. But Schlieffen thought that an envelopment maneuver meant that any obstacle, whether a river or a neutral country, could replace the infantry in envelopment, that the envelopment could work on any scale, whether a field or multiple nations. So Canet's single afternoon for Hannibal was stretched to a grueling month, and it came to involve huge, huge distances. So Hannibal didn't have to deal with railroads or the Belgian border or other things, and that's why it ultimately didn't work for Germany in World War I. But getting back to the big uh, topic of this episode, this uh, worship of Cannae wasn't just a tactic. It was perfect for Prussia because they saw themselves as a nation, um, an army with a nation, that due to superior tactics could defeat stronger foes. So the Prussian military mindset, um, it inculcated values in its citizens. It arguably created the German nation. It's what led to World War I, and it's really important. So that's all I have for this episode. Thank you so much for the question. And um, I think this goes to show that this isn't just a little fringe corner of European military history, but Prussia had incredible impact on the creation of the modern world.